Hey folks, Jack Spierko here. Um, today I started a cryptocurrency practical discussion group on MeWe, and it has, well, it's taken off pretty quick. We started this morning right now. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll approve some members right now. We'll get first names only. Dan and Susan, you have been approved. And with that, we are up to 279 members in a MeWe group. In about six hours. That's pretty good. And it's starting to get some discussion and all. And I'm going to use this to create some really simple, maybe not so much beginner videos, but understanding videos. Like, not everything that's a fundamental understanding is really a beginner topic. There's people that have done things a long time, but they don't have a fundamental understanding. And I ask some of you guys that are really technical can, and can explain this thing at a, a technical level much higher than I can today to understand that I can explain it at a higher level than I'm going to explain it technically today. I'm trying to explain it so there's enough of an understanding, a fundamental understanding of what's going on behind the scenes so that a person who's new to this can have some confidence in it and understand what their options are and, and why they might uh, take them. And the one that's been coming up a lot today, and it's probably because we've been talking about R or Pirate Chain a lot on the podcast and discussion groups, etc., is what's the difference between like the Ocean Wallet for Pirate or the Light Wallet, wallet for Pirate? Um, and that is something that comes up in a lot of different situations. When people are not using, you know, a third-party wallet like Jax or Coinami or whatever, even though you hold your own keys and it's non-custodial, it's still a third-party wallet. There's things going on we're not going to get into today uh, where a third party is providing a service. We're going to talk about that service, but we're not going to dig into how it works for Jax or Coinami. If there's an interest in that, we'll do that on a different day. Let's just take it to you've decided you want to uh, partake in a, a particular cryptocurrency. So that no one gets bogged down with any specifics. We're going to call it goldfish coin. Why? Because I have fish behind me, and even though none of them are goldfish, it just sounded cool. So let's say that somebody rolls out a new cryptocurrency called goldfish coin. It catches a little bit of uh, excitement. It actually gets some, some exchanges. You can buy it. You can trade it. It has a value, and you want to get involved with goldfish coin. So you go to goldfishcoin.io or whatever, and you, you see that you can, you can download a wallet. Usually there's what we call a native wallet, something that was made by the people or the community that created Goldfish Coin. And let's just say, to make things really simple today, you have two options, Goldfish Wallet and Goldfish Wallet Lite, all right? And so what happens if you download Goldfish Wallet, when you start setting everything up and get it running, you're running a node on the network. We'll talk about what that means in a second, but essentially... That wallet is going to have, within its framework, after it's all installed and synced and going, the entire Goldfish blockchain. So every time something happens in the Goldfish world, a Goldfish coin is mined or sent or whatever, it is part of a new block, and a new block is added to the chain. And this happens often, a bunch of times a day. doesn't matter how many times. But you get that. Every time a block runs, every time... Uh, a group of transactions are run, a new block is formed, and it's added to the chain, and it builds. What that means is if Goldfish Coin's been around a while, it's a pretty big blockchain, and it could be a couple gig or more in size. It's now all living on your hard drive on your computer. And it is constantly checking with all the other nodes, anybody else running the full node on, on the wallet, and saying, hey, is there anything new? What's going on? Here's what I see. What do you see? We'll talk about that in a second. But the important thing for you to understand is that blockchain is getting bigger multiple times every day. And it's using processing power and space on your computer. Most of the people that are doing this are either altruistic. They believe in goldfish coins. So they set up a computer just for goldfish coin. Or they have a big enough, powerful enough computer that maybe they have a computer that's running a Goldfish Coin wallet and a Tiger Barb wallet, right, at the same time on, on that computer. But you are putting a strain on that computer to do that. Most of the people that are running full nodes are miners. Well, of course, they get some Goldfish Coin in return for doing their job. So they are, they are given an incentive through their activities to have it. But if all you have is a wallet... 
you're either doing this just because you're another node on the network and thereby helping, or you don't know any better. <laughs> Those are the only two reasons you would do that if you weren't mining or providing some sort of third-party service that we're leaving out today. Right. Now, if you're running the light wallet, there's multiple ways that this problem is solved, but the most basic fundamental way that I can point to it is if you're running the full Goldfish coin wallet, you're storing transactions that happened between two people in say Watanao four years ago when Goldfish coin was launched. And you're st storing that forever. If you're using Goldfish Lite, some point that the, the height of the chain has been reached, we've had enough confirmations on it, enough nodes, enough machines have said this we all agree to, it becomes like a safe point, like a restore point on your Windows computer. Okay? And then you don't need it no more. You start from there, and you only have the top of the chain on your device. That's how mobile wallets have to work because there's no way you can do what we're talking about on a cell phone. It's not possible, right? It would, your, your cell phone would smoke off in your pocket and catch you on fire, not to mention it probably doesn't have enough space on it for this to occur. So that's, that's what happens between the difference between the two. So let's talk about why that's the case. And the best way I can explain this to explain like what nodes are and what they do with their function and role in a blockchain environment are is to use the old game we used to call telephone when we were kids. So now imagine there's 20 of us sitting in a circle. And we're all nodes. But we don't have a blockchain. We have a handoff of a piece of information around the chain. And so I say to the person next to me, Goldfish coin rocks. And then they say what they think I said to the next person and so on and so on and so on. And the old joke is that by the time number 20 gets over here and tells me what I supposedly said, it's purple monkey dishwasher. Right? We've all played telephone when we were kids, or at least you should have. If you didn't, you missed out on an experience. So the issue there is each time the information is passed along, there's a potential for corruption of the data. But imagine if instead of saying goldfish coin rocks, I held up a piece of paper that everybody could see that said goldfish coin rocks. And everybody then transcribed that information, Goldfish Coin Rock. So we all look at it. We all agree. This is what it says. And then we file that piece of paper. That was block number one. And then another transaction comes in, and it's Goldfish Coin sucks. So one of the nodes receives that, and all the nodes are receiving it either directly or indirectly from other nodes. And pretty soon everybody holds up a piece of paper, and we all agree. We come to consensus that that's what it said. We file it, and that's another lock. This is oversimplification, okay? But it's the best way I know to explain to somebody that doesn't get it at all. People say, why, why do we expend all this computing energy? How does that make Bitcoin or Goldfish coin or uh, Tiger Shark coin or whatever worth money? And it's that it creates an environment where you can't create a counterfeit, we're all checking each other's work all the time, and we're all coming to consensus and agreeing upon it. And thereby, the coin that is, or the group, the fraction of a coin that is Goldfish Coin Rocks as a code, can't be duplicated ever again. So all of a sudden, the person that originally sent that transaction, Goldfish Coin Rocks, decides, I want to send it to somebody else. We all know where it is, and then we agree on where it's going, and then we call it done after a certain number of us confirm it within that group. We're all, again, we're all nodes on this group. And now we know where it is. When you have the light wallet, you're looking at the top of the chain only because it's agreed upon or you, re you can be reasonably sure that everything below that point, it, it's never going to change. It's already done. It already happened. It's over. You don't care anymore. All you care about is your coin, that, it, that the people that sent it to you actually sent it to you. You actually have it. You didn't get ripped off. And that if you send it somewhere, it goes where you want it to go. 
So the Light Wallet enables a great user experience. It's very quick. It's very lightweight. It's very thin on resource use. When you fire it up, you know it only has to sync that last little bit again to see where it was at. So you don't have to run it 24/7, 365. It doesn't clutter up your hard drive with a bunch of crap. It's the easy way to go. And there are purists who actually don't like Light Wallets. Well, there's a reason that every major crypto pro uh, project has a Light Wallet. Because they know that if they don't do that, it won't get used. And while it's great that some people set up a dedicated machine to serve as a node on a, on a blockchain, that's fine. I really appreciate you for doing that. I'm sure that the people behind the project really appreciate that. You also have to have people that actually use it, that actually use the currency. And very few people right now are going to put the entire Bitcoin blockchain on their home personal computer. I'm not going to. So when you're looking at a cryptocurrency like R, you'll see that they have various wallets and one grouping of those wallets is light. And that's what that means. It means you're kind of working from that agreed upon safe point forward. And as the blockchain gets higher and higher, that safe point moves higher on the chain. So you're only dealing with a small piece at any one given time. So you're concerned about what you have, what you're holding, and does it match the top of the chain? And as long as it does, you know that you could. That's how that works. Um, and it's really not that complicated. And it's why I recommend for most people, especially if you, if you didn't know this in the first place, you probably want to run the light version of whatever wallet you're installing. Now, some places you'll find that pretty much a light wallet is what you have unless you're specifically going out of your way. Like when I say get the wallet here and there's like one download link for like, you know, Mac, Linux, and Windows, it's all a light wallet. Arc is like that because unless you're serving as a node on the network intentionally as a delegate is what they call it there, you, you, there'd be no reason for you to have a full blockchain. You can go get a way to look at it if you really want to. That's why it's public and open source, but you don't need to. So if you're new to Pirate, for instance, R-A-R-R-R, -R -R -R, um, and you should be because it's the ultimate in privacy coins, in my opinion, unless you have a compelling reason. Otherwise, use the Light Wallet. And with that, we will come at you later. Maybe we'll talk about the next episode where we talk about cryptocurrency. Um, maybe we'll talk about how a third-party non-custodial wallet like a Coinami or a Jax works. It's kind of somewhere in the middle, but we don't need to go there today. Hope this clears th some things up. And if you want to be involved in a group of people discussing cryptocurrency with about a bunch of idiots constantly trying to pump the latest crap coin that's going to go to the moon and make them a Lamborghini or something so that they can try to get... They're actually stupid enough to think if they infiltrate a group and get you know 20 people to buy it, it's going to jack the price up so they can cash in. If you don't want to deal with crap like that, if you don't want to deal with people that are constantly making videos about how you should give them money, and you want to deal with people who are really just trying to figure this all out and helping each other out, check out the MeWe group for cryptocurrency discussion that we started today. Again, uh, we've got a couple hundred members, and... Uh, a new one, just while we're doing this here. Another new member. Let's see. It's um, Joe. You are approved. Uh, 280 members so far. Come join us. And if you have questions for me that I can help you out with with a video like this for the group and for Odyssey, YouTube, etc., uh, let me know and I'll see what I can do. I can't promise to do one a day or anything like that like Miyagi Mornings, but uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks just to get people over these basic hurdles. Thank you, and uh, again, appreciate all of you that tune into my content.